Good morning, folks. We've got a number of things to cover today, including space weather, earth weather, and top science news. We're starting, as always, over at spaceweathernews.com and finding the last 24 hours on our star were visually calm. Minor motions only around the limb, and in that 10 o'clock position, we can spot yet another active region developing behind the limb. But the imminent space weather is in the solar wind. Coronal hole stream impact sent plasma speed over 600 kilometers per second for the first time in months. The stream is of solid speed, but had a very light leading density component, and so the brief geomagnetic instability is all we've seen from the stream thus far. We're going to wrap up our look at the sun as we find the 304 angstrom view, and we're going to compare to this day eight years ago back in 2012. Despite the current uptick in active regions, we've got a long road to hoe to solar maximum. Coming next to the hurricane, it has largely danced offshore the last 24 hours once again, has struggled to maintain a solid eye, but does have all the earth spot penumbral lines on the outside. Meteorologists call them whistlers, and today they've got a little bit of space weather to feed on. Interestingly, from the global electric circuit perspective, the storm does match the usual pattern. Air sucks in at ground level and is redeposited up out of the central column high into the atmosphere, and with hurricanes, it often reaches the jet stream, like we see here. This is the energy flow from the ground upward, and the path it's taking there is quite obvious given the electrophilic flow of water vapor. It's the Atlantic high-pressure cells driving the flows eventually streaming into the lows. Down from the ionosphere onto the highs, lateral flow at the boundary layers like the ground or marine layer, and then back up in the storms. We also want to mention a typhoon that came together very quickly here north of Taiwan. Today, it is going to be charging up into China. A commentary about the Parker Solar Probe and the ESA Solar Orbiter up next. These two craft are already starting their science and will continue for some time, basically setting the solar wind stage for academia going forward. But how representative are they actually going to be? How has the solar wind changed since the sun exited Grand Maximum? How do the interplanetary magnetic fields change? And how does the current sheet change as the sun descends in activity? One wonders if they are just a few years late to get a total picture. And the same issue exists for IBEX, which was launched in 2008, also after the Grand Solar Maximum had ended. While we can admire the first IBEX representation of the Earth bow shock, we must remember that even with 12 years of data, the craft never got up in time to see the sun in her prime. Folks, the core paradigm confirming paper today comes as a near total atmosphere macro scale look at solar forcing, concluding that via effects on the ozone and stratosphere, you do indeed couple downward to affect the troposphere, most notably in the cloud condensation nuclei, geopotential height, and joule heating. We're going to piggyback on that concept for a moment, because four well-known mainstream climate blogs all hit this story the last couple of days, a publisher correction to a solar forcing of the climate change article. The problem is they all apparently stopped at the title because while they claim corrections to a solar forcing paper means there was a mistake, the correction was the affiliation of an author, a different author being listed as a corresponding author, and where they said in their paper that the data set will be available upon publication, they have now corrected that to say the data is available at, etc. Literally not a single substantive correction, and it didn't need one. In an excellent paper out of the EGU, we find that electron forcing is important to ozone effects from space weather. Commonly, people consider the UV ozone production and proton destruction, but the electron forcing is too often overlooked. Suggestion here is to broaden that data analyzed in the situation. Moment of levity as I see what these guys did here, exploring the possibility that dark matter interactions and collisions in space could cause gamma rays and affect Earth extinctions only to eventually conclude that no, no, NOVA events are the more likely explanation. Well played, you three. And last but not least, the Arctic freshwater shift is beginning. We just shared this week the paper detailing how their previous flow maps were way off and suggested that they didn't make mistakes in the past, just that things are shifting quickly. Here we find the same sort of sentiment and narrative as the new freshwater dynamics begin to take over the northern waters. And on that point, a terrific topic with which to get acquainted is the cold climate bomb Yale and others say is waiting to be unleashed on the world. It starts in the Beaufort Gyre, and it's basically a realistic scenario to produce the ultra-freeze from the movie The Day After Tomorrow. It just takes months or years, not four days like in the movie. 
This information can be found in the climate playlist as well. That's listed below this video on YouTube in the description box. Website members, what you should watch today is your latest deeper look on yesterday's Birkeland Currents paper. The electrodynamic interaction with the solar wind is exactly what Brian Tinsley discussed at our conference in 2019. And your latest deeper look episode connects his work with the new paper and explain why this matters for both the earth and the sun. We greatly appreciate your support. A reminder that all links and playlists can be found in that list right below the YouTube video. We've got your wind maps and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here, but right now it's 5.30 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.